224. Adiaphorism and Totalitarianism. Calcedon Position Paper, number 17. November, 1980. One of the more important but neglected controversies of church history has been the struggle over adiaphorism, that is, over things indifferent. Essentially, the controversy has been over the realm of things which stand outside the Word of God, over what is and is not legislated. Obviously, at the heart of this concept of adiaphora is a doctrine of God and the nature and extent of his government and law. However, for most theological traditions, the argument over adiaphora is an old and settled one, and the issue is not seen as a very lively one in our time. On closer examination, however, it becomes apparent that the issue is far from settled and that the concept of adiaphora is anything but biblical. The concept, in fact, comes from the ancient Cynic and Stoic philosophers, and its presence in church history is evidence of a pagan infiltration. It is thus important to review briefly the Cynic and Stoic views. For the Cynics and Stoics, Man existed in an essentially meaningless material cosmos. Value, meaning and morality had no meaning in that material world. They were, rather, personal and spiritual or mental concerns and concepts. In brief, value and meaning are derived from the self and are virtually identical with it. The moral goal is thus self-sufficiency and the wise and moral man is absolutely self-sufficient and recognises that the material world is a world of morally indifferent things. In such a view, which Diogenes held in dramatic form, there is no law nor meaning outside of man. All things physical are indifferent. Only man's mind makes a difference in its attitudes, which are the source of values. This view first entered the church as a heresy. Harpocrates and his followers saw nothing evil by nature, or, for that matter, good, with the only values being faith and love, attitudes of the self. The Nicolaites were very precise in stating the extent of things indifferent. Adultery was for them a matter of indifference. Of the doctrines of Carpocrates, Irenaeus reported that he held that we are saved, indeed, by means of faith and love, but all other things, while in their nature indifferent, are reckoned by the opinions of men, some good and some evil, there being nothing really evil by nature. Very early, too, these Hellenic ideas of adiaphorism entered into the apparently orthodox tradition of Christian thought. Clement of Alexandria held, Fit objects for admiration are the Stoics, who say that the soul is not affected by the body, either to vice by disease or to virtue by health. But both these things, they say, are indifferent. Clement's point here is not an attack on environmentalism, but an assertion of the separate beings of mind and body, and the necessity to cultivate the independence of the mind or soul from the morally indifferent realm of matter. For Clement, a good life is happiness, and the man who is adorned in his soul with virtue is happy. For Clement, virtue is to be defined in Hellenic terms, Greek philosophy for him paved the way, and Christianity simply added to that structure the incarnate truth, the Son of God. Although at one time philosophy justified the Greeks, not conducting them to that entire righteousness to which it is ascertained to cooperate, as the first and second flight of steps help you in your ascent to the upper room, and the grammarian helps the philosopher, 
not as if by its abstraction the perfect word would be rendered incomplete or truth perish. Since also sight, hearing, and the voice contribute to truth, but it is the mind which is the appropriate faculty for knowing it. But of those things which cooperate, some contribute a greater amount of power, some a less. Perpiscuity accordingly aids in the communication of truth and logic in preventing us from falling onto the heresies by which we are assailed. But the teaching, which is according to the Saviour, is complete in itself and without defect, being the power and wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. And the Hellenic philosophy does not, by its approach, make the truth more powerful, but rendering powerless the assault of sophistry against it and frustrating the treacherous plots laid against the truth is said to be the proper fence and wall of the vineyard. For Clement, the true and Christian Gnostic, withdraws from the indifferent world of material things to commune with God and to approximate God's impassibility by his own indifference to external things. When, therefore, he who partakes Gnostically of this holy quality devotes himself to contemplation, communing in purity with the divine, he enters more nearly into the state of impassable identity, so as no longer to have science and possess knowledge, but to be science and knowledge. Given such a perspective, it is easy to see why the Church moved, first into asceticism. An indifference to material things was seen as a mark of morality. The material world itself was now, in cynic fashion, seen as adiaphora, as a thing of indifference to true religion and morality. Second, the Old Testament was no longer seen as on the same plane as the New, and the New Testament was viewed in Hellenic terms and as the spiritual book in contrast to the materialism of the Old. The apostolic preaching had been from Old Testament texts, which were viewed as more alive and relevant than ever with the coming of Christ. Now the Old Testament was regarded as a lesser, more primitive, and hence materialistic revelation. God's law was thus seen as belonging to a lower era of revelation, and hence now less relevant, if at all so. This view, then and now, has led to antinomianism. Third, as with the cynics, morality was now reduced also to a mental attitude. Since things material are morally indifferent, then only man's spiritual states can be moral. Logically, the cynics and also Carprocrates and Nicolaites saw now evil in material acts, in adultery, homosexuality and the like. On the whole, despite periodic lapses, the Church worked to avoid such a conclusion, however logical. This opinion did remain as an undercurrent, as Boccaccio witnessed. In the concluding paragraph of his Decameron, he states flatly that he was writing the truth about friars and others. In the seventh story of the third day, a lover tells a married woman, whose refusal earlier had driven him into exile, For a woman to have converse with a man is a sin of nature, but to rob him or slay him or drive him into exile proceedeth from malignity of mind. In other words, adultery is a lesser sin than deliberately depriving a lover, because sins of the mind are more important than sins of the flesh. In the eighth story of the third day, an abbot convinces a woman that adultery with him is not a serious matter. The lady, hearing this, was all aghast and answered, Alack, father mine, what is this you ask? Methought you were a saint. 
doth it beseem holy men to require women who come to them for counsel of such things? Fair my soul, rejoined the abbot, marvel not, for that sanctity no wise abateth by this, seeing it hath its seat in the soul, and that which I ask of you is a sin of the body. This is a mild form of an opinion which has, in the twentieth century, become more common among Protestant antinomians and modernists. It was in the early 1940s when I first encountered a pastor of some prominence who held that any sexual relationship, as long as it was truly personal and loving, was valid and moral. He was quite insistent that this was the true spirit of the gospel and that my perspective was legalistic and unloving. Peter Abelard was a strong champion of adiaphorism. According to Vierkamp, he suggested that apart from the intention of all human actions considered in themselves are indifferent. The problem of adiaphora became confused in church history because it represents an alien religious premise transposed into a biblical faith. The concept of adiaphora presupposes, first, a dialectical and or a dualistic worldview. It assumes that there are two kinds of being, matter on the one hand, and spirit, mind or idea on the other. Of these two, matter is seen as either morally indifferent or relatively far less important. Such a view of being is clearly anti-biblical. Scripture sees mind and matter as alike one kind of being, created being. The contrast is rather to the uncreated being of God. Second, the universe of the cynics and of adiaphorism is explicitly or implicitly a meaningless realm of brute or meaningless and unrelated factuality. There is no God whose eternal decree gives total meaning to all things. Adiaphorism presupposes an area or realm of indifferentism and neutrality. The arguments used to defend this realm of neutrality go something like this. No morality is involved in a simple walk through the countryside or a pleasure drive in one's automobile on a Sunday afternoon. The answer is that, because this is totally God's creation and a moral universe, we can never step outside the moral realm into an indifferent one. Our driving is either responsible and hence moral, or it involves a contempt for the life and property of others, a moral fact. Our walk can be an enjoyment of life and the world around us, a moral fact, or it can involve trespassing, playing at peeping Tom, discarding paper trash and so on, all moral facts. In one presbytery, in an argument in favour of adiaphorism, a pastor declared, Paul probably travelled at times by ox cart. Are we bound to do the same? The means are thus indifferent, he held. We can travel by cart or car without any moral connotation involved. But is travel morally indifferent? A young man, a student who answered an advertisement offering a free ride from coast to coast in return for driving, found himself in a vehicle with two thieves and two prostitutes, more or less a captive, and having reason to believe that the car was a stolen one. We can never step into a morally neutral realm. To assume that, because no problems arise, a situation is therefore morally neutral, is a serious fallacy. Third, adiaphorism presupposes that morality is only a mental outlook, that is, that it is essentially a matter of love. Feminists have argued, as of others, that a wife's sexual relations with her husband can be moral or immoral, depending on whether or not it is a loving act or a reluctant duty, 
The same is held to be true of any other sexual relationship, adulterous or homosexual. Its morality is determined by the presence of love. Fourth, as is already apparent, the universe being totally God's creation. Nothing is outside his government and law. There is nothing thus which is morally indifferent. The classic text used by Adiaphorism is Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Supposedly, this verse reduces morality to a mental state. On the contrary, it does not presuppose the morally neutral world and meaningless universe of the cynics, but God's creation, which is totally good in origin. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 Fallen man perverts even the pure things to make them impure. If all things are pure and good, then nothing can be called adiaphora, and if too, them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Again, we have excluded adiaphora. Since all things are made by God, there is no neutral relationship to anything. However, adiaphorism in church history has presupposed a universe belonging to the cynics rather than created by God. Not only so, but adiaphorism has been a catch-all for several kinds of problems in church history. First, with respect especially to the forms of worship and church order, the argument has been between those who declare that only that which is specifically required and permitted is binding, and those who hold that whatever is not forbidden is permitted. This argument has been further confused by the fact that usually both sides have gone only to the New Testament, or mainly so, to determine what is permitted. Augustine early complained that the yoke of the Pharisees was being surpassed by church traditions, which were legislating in areas of supposed permission. Second, as already indicated, the question was, what is the scope of the binding word? Is it the whole word of God, the Old and New Testaments alike, the law, prophets and gospel, or is it only the law of Christ, something supposedly abstracted from the New Testament? Third, there was the developmental view, as in Joachim of Fiore, and at the Reformation in Sebastian Frank. From this perspective, the Old and New Testaments alike spoke to babes and to the infancy of mankind. Such spiritualists held that forms, sacraments and law represented outworn and weak elements, useful for the infancy of the faith, but due to be discarded in the age of the spirit. All dependence on such materialistic externals was turned by Frank as a reliance on the dregs of Satan, the inference being dualistic, that is, the realm of law, forms and matter belong to Satan, and that God seeks to wean us from it. Fourth, still another problem was incorporated into the issue of adiaphora, the problem of the weak and the strong. The Pauline argument was thus again altered. The strong were now seen as those who knew that the things which troubled the weak were indifferent things. As with Titus chapter 1 verse 15, the presupposition imported into Romans chapter 14 verse 1 to chapter 15 verse 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 to 13, and chapter 10 verses 25 to 33, is of a morally neutral universe. Paul, however, tells the weak and the strong that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 28 An entirely different presupposition. 
It should be clear now that adiaphorism is a concept which has no place in Christian thought. Unhappily, the concept is used, and in some works, Christian morality is discussed, not from the perspective of God's infallible law word, but from the perspective of adiaphorism. The problem, moreover, is not simply an antiquarian one, but of very great significance for church and state. Church and state alike cannot be confined to their God-given realms and limited spheres unless adiaphorism is dropped. First, because adiaphorism holds to a morally indifferent universe, or, in modified forms, to areas of moral indifference. The sovereign power of God is limited, and the powers of man, or of man's agencies, such as church and state, are accordingly extended Man then has areas of life wherein he can legislate and act independently of God and his word. At certain points, life and the universe become open to man's imperialism, to man's legislation and freedom. Sunday morning religion is a natural outcome of adiaphorism. God's legitimate concerns are, in practice, limited by Sunday morning religion, to a limited spiritual realm. Churches which teach adiaphorism have no legitimate ground for complaining that their members limit the scope and jurisdiction of their faith. Adiaphorism is a denial of the sovereignty of God and an affirmation that, in given areas at least, man is a free agent and his own lawmaker. Second, as Augustine pointed out, the Church very early created a burden of laws and traditions as rigid and more so than the yoke of the Pharisees. Adiaphorism gives vast powers to the Church. Both Protestantism and Roman Catholicism have used the concept of adiaphora to enlarge ecclesiastical powers. Both have seen the evils of one another, but not the fundamental issue. If any area is morally indifferent in terms of Scripture, it can then be an area of moral indifference to men, or an area of legislation by man, or by church and state. It is a, quote, free, end quote, area for man's imperialism, a place where supposedly God has no jurisdiction, or exercises none, and man is free to do so. Thus, some years ago, I was charged with a fearful offence, namely teaching the Bible outside the church on the Lord's Day without permission. I asked where, apart from Presbytery's will, this was forbidden, demanding biblical warrants. The answer was given that 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order was a warrant from God to the church to govern in such areas in order to ensure that all things be done decently and in order. Paul's sentence, however, is not a general warrant for any kind of ordering, but specifically a summation requiring that his precise requirements for the order of particular meetings be kept. Paul was speaking against, not in favour of, any independent powers on the part of a church or congregation to order its worship and or affairs. Third, adiaphorism not only hands the church vast powers uncontrolled by scripture, but the state also. The state sees itself as its own lawmaker and hence its own god, because lawmaking is the prerogative of a god. It is an attribute of sovereignty and deity. The Church, having declared that biblical law is now a matter of adiaphora, the state, as well as the Church, is free to play God walking on earth and to legislate at will. The modern state is the result of adiaphorism. As long as the doctrine of adiaphora is retained, man will have a problem with totalitarianism in church and state. 
It will allow the modern state's every freedom to expand its powers, because aliaphorism withdraws the sovereign claims, powers, and governments of God from one area after another, leaving finally very little to the kingdom of God other than a weak and simpering love, an antinomian religion of love. Adiaphorism is at the roots of antinomianism, and it is basic to the decline of the power of Christianity. True, the doctrine is an old and venerable one, but then the tempter's doctrine, Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 5, has even greater venerability. Long ago, Jerome stated the thesis of the doctrine in its ecclesiastical form. That is indifference, which is neither good nor evil, so that, whether you do it or do it not, you are never the more just or unjust thereby. Using the freedom granted by this concept, Rome justified the mass and images, and Protestantism justified a variety of church rules, while each condemned the other. This is not surprising. Once the premise of adiaphorism is accepted, men are free to define for themselves the realm of the indifferent. God's powers of definition and lawmaking become then the prerogatives of men, and we have Catholic, Reformed, Lutheran and Anglican doctrines of adiaphorism, and now no less the status doctrines as well. After all, the U.S. Supreme Court transferred abortion to the realm of adiaphora. The Soviet Union and Red China have done even better. Adiaphorism means that, for vast areas, the rule which governs is simply this. Let man's will prevail. The Humanistic Doctrine of Infallibility November 1980 In my study, Infallibility, an inescapable concept, I pointed out that every system of thought has, if not an open, at least a hidden and implicit doctrine of infallibility. The locale of infallibility will vary. It can be man's autonomous reason, the ascetic experience, the state, a ruler, and or a variety of other things. Men may ridicule an alien doctrine of infallibility, but it will be only to vindicate their own. In the modern era, the most popular doctrine of infallibility comes to us from Rousseau through Kant and Hegel. Infallibility rests in man, not individual man, but in the general will of all men, which is held to be, by nature, unerring and good. This general will is not ascertained by majority vote, but by its expression in the elite rulers of the state, who embody or incarnate the general will. Over the years, this infallible general will has had a variety of names and incarnations. Two popular ones of recent years have been the dictatorship of the proletariat and the democratic consensus. The new name is public policy. In the name of public policy, a variety of evils are being promoted today. Increasingly, in the name of equality and rights, freedom of speech is being denied to Christians because biblical faith requires that sin be condemned, whereas humanism increasingly insists on equal rights for sin. Thus, a very prominent and forthright Texas pastor has been denied the freedom to continue broadcasting his Sunday morning sermons on television. In a sermon, he condemned homosexuality as a sin. This was seen as against public policy, and his freedom to preach was curtailed. In California, 63 churches have lost their tax-exempt status and face sale of their properties for refusal to pay taxes. Their troubles began when a stand was made against homosexuality. To speak out against this and like matters is now against public policy, the new, quote, law, end quote. 
Similarly, many courts are assuming that a children's, quote, Bill of Rights, end quote, like Sweden's, has been made law here because of public policy. Christian parents, routinely administering either discipline or chastisement to their children, have been taken to court. Moreover, public policy is redefining the family, as the recent White House conference made clear. The biblical definition of the family has been rejected. The true family is now seen as the voluntary family. This can be a group of homosexuals, runaway youths, or a sexual commune. Public policy seeks to give it the protection once given to the covenant family. These trends are becoming known to more and more people, but the reaction is too often one of religious idiocy. The idea is to pass a law to correct these evils. These evils, however, are not so much a product of legislation as of a religious faith in the state and its saving power. To turn to the state for relief is to aggravate that very evil. Moreover, there is a grim fact too seldom appreciated by, quote, reformers, end quote. Virtually all new laws, whether good or bad, have as their consequence the increase of the state's bureaucracy. Thus, the one usual and predictable result of a new law is greater power for the bureaucracy and an increased growth. Reform laws are hence seldom a problem to a bureaucracy. The reformers legislate new laws, appropriate money for their enforcement, and the rest is up to the bureaucracy. But this is not all. No law is likely to mean, in execution and in results, what it meant in purpose and passage. When a new law is enacted, its meaning and enforcement become the province of the bureaucracy and the courts. Since legislators, good and bad alike, are not at the same time in law enforcement, they cannot predict or foresee all the practical problems which the application of law creates. This very real and important function, the bureaucracy and the courts discharge. The predictable result is the growth of the bureaucracy. Add to that bureaucracy and to the courts the doctrine of public policy, and the law is immediately subject to a radically different meaning. The US Constitution thus has been, quote, amended, end quote, and altered more often by the varying faith and expectation of the American people than by Congress and the states. The Constitution today means not what the framers meant, but what public policy today dictates. A key tenet of this humanistic public policy doctrine is the, quote, equality, end quote, of good and evil. In fact, however, no such equality exists. If evil cannot be condemned, then righteousness is condemned. If a Christian pastor cannot speak out on television against homosexuality, it means that homosexuality has a freedom to condemn and silence Christianity. Such a doctrine of equality is another name for the suppression of the freedom of Christianity. Public policy today is another name for humanistic morality and its mandatory status. Humanistic morality governs our bureaucracies, our state schools, the press, films, television and more, and is promoted from Washington DC down. Public policy is beginning to declare that free speech by the church must be punished. Is the Catholic Church against abortion? Move to revoke its freedom and tax-exempt status. Have Protestant churches spoken out against homosexuality? Their tax exemption must be revoked and their freedom curtailed. Public policy today means humanistic policy. For this reason, every attempt by evangelical pastors and churches to revive a concern for social order among their congregations, to encourage them to vote as Christians, 
and to seek to command the political processes for Christ's cause is greeted with hypocritical wails of dismay. Supposedly, all this represents a revival of Nazi faith. But it is these public policy advocates who are the architects of our new fascism, an economic and political fascism which retains the forms of freedom but uses them as a facade for state socialism. These people see themselves as the incarnation of the general will and the infallible voices of today and tomorrow. They identify their will with public policy and the rest of us with evil. Theirs is a false faith. The only answer to it is the biblical faith and its application to every area of life and thought.